Lesson 4 The Eyes of the Lord The Biblical Worldview Sabbath Afternoon October 17 The heritage that God has promised to His people is not in this world. Abraham had no possession in the earth, no, not so much as to set his foot on. Acts chapter 7 verse 5 He possessed great substance, and he used it to the glory of God and the good of his fellow men. But he did not look upon this world as his home. The Lord had called him to leave his idolatrous countrymen with the promise of the land of Canaan as an everlasting possession. Yet neither he nor his son nor his son's son received it. When Abraham desired a burial place for his dead, he had to buy it of the Canaanites. His sole possession in the land of promise was that rock-hewn tomb in the cave of Machpelah. But the word of God had not failed. The fulfillment of God's promise may seem to be long delayed, for one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8. It may appear to tarry, but at the appointed time, it will surely come. It will not tarry. Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 3. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 169. Let your soul be absorbed in meditating upon the glorious truths contained in the Word of God, and you will have no constant craving for something which you have not. You will despise cheap, vain thoughts. You will be ever trying to meet the elevated standard of virtue and holiness which is kept before you in the gospel. You will seek for higher attainments in the divine life. Converse with God through the medium of His Word. By contemplating the lofty ideal He has placed before you, you will be uplifted into a pure and holy atmosphere, even the presence of God. When you abide here, there goes forth from you a light which irradiates all who are connected with you. In Heavenly Places, page 161. His commandments and grace are adapted to our necessities, and without them we cannot be saved, do what we may. Acceptable obedience he requires. The offering of goods or any service will not be accepted without the heart. The will must be brought into subjection. The Lord requires of you a greater consecration to him and a greater separation from the spirit and influence of the world. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Christ has called you to be his followers, to imitate his life of self-sacrifice and self-denial, to be interested in the great work of the redemption of the fallen race. Christ is your pattern. That in which you are deficient is love. This pure and holy principle distinguishes the character and conduct of Christians from those of worldlings. Divine love has a powerful purifying influence. It is to be found only in renewed hearts and naturally flows out to their fellow men. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 2, page 169 Sunday, October 18 The Eyes of the Lord The fool hath said in his heart, There is no God. The mightiest intellects of earth cannot comprehend God. If he reveals himself at all to men, it is by veiling himself in mystery. His ways are past finding out. Men must be ever searching, ever learning, and yet there is an infinity beyond. Could they fully understand the purposes, wisdom, love, and character of God, they would not believe in him as an infinite being and trust him with the interests of their souls. If they could fathom him, he would no longer stand supreme. There are men who think they have made wonderful discoveries in science, but the scientific research in which these men have indulged has proved a snare to them. It has clouded their minds, and they have drifted into skepticism. They have exalted their human wisdom in opposition to the wisdom of the great and mighty God and have dared to enter into controversy with Him. The word of inspiration pronounces these men fools. Selected Messages, Book 3, pages 306 
and 307. When we have a promise that is so rich and so full as John chapter 3 verses 14 to 19, I inquire, what excuse have any of us for unbelief? What excuse have you to say? I don't think the Lord hears my prayer. I wish I could believe I was a Christian, or I wish I could have the evidence that I was a child of God. Feelings are very changeable, but here are the precious words of eternal life. What is evidence? Is it a flight of feeling? Is it an emotion of the heart that gives you the evidence that you are a child of God? But here is the precious word of eternal life, and it gives us the assurance that we may lay hold on the hope set before us in the gospel by living faith. This Day with God, page 223. All who have a sense of their deep soul poverty, who feel that they have nothing good in themselves, may find righteousness and strength by looking unto Jesus. He says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. He bids you exchange your poverty for the riches of his grace. We are not worthy of God's love, but Christ, our surety, is worthy and is abundantly able to save all who shall come unto him. Whatever may have been your past experience, however discouraging your present circumstances, if you will come to Jesus just as you are, weak, helpless, and despairing, our compassionate Savior will meet you a great way off and will throw about you his arms of love and his robe of righteousness. He presents us to the Father clothed in the white raiment of his own character. He pleads before God in our behalf, saying, I have taken the sinner's place. Look not upon this wayward child, but look on me. Does Satan plead loudly against our souls, accusing of sin and claiming us as his prey? The blood of Christ pleads with greater power. Thoughts from the Mount of Blessing, pages 8 and 9. Monday, October 19. Leibniz's Question. In God's word only we find an authentic account of creation. In this word only can we find a history of our race unsullied by human prejudice or human pride. Here we may hold communion with patriarchs and prophets and listen to the voice of the Eternal as He speaks with men. Here we behold the majesty of heaven as He humbled Himself to become our substitute and surety to cope single-handed with the powers of darkness and to gain the victory in our behalf. A reverent contemplation of such themes as these cannot fail to soften, purify, and ennoble the heart, and at the same time to inspire the mind with new strength and vigor. My Life Today, page 107 there is a constant effort made to explain the work of creation as the result of natural causes, and human reasoning is accepted even by professed Christians in opposition to plain scripture facts. There are many who oppose the investigation of the prophecies, especially those of Daniel and the Revelation, declaring them to be so obscure that we cannot understand them. Yet these very persons eagerly receive the suppositions of geologists in contradiction of the Mosaic record. But if that which God has revealed is so difficult to understand, how inconsistent it is to accept mere suppositions in regard to that which He has not revealed. The secret things belong unto the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong unto us and to our children forever. Deuteronomy chapter 29, verse 29. Just how God accomplished the work of creation, He has never revealed to men. Human science cannot search out the secrets of the Most High. His creative power is as incomprehensible as His existence. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 113. God has permitted a flood of light to be poured upon the world in the discoveries of science and art. But when professedly scientific men reason upon these subjects from a merely human point of view, they are sure to err. 
the greatest minds, if not guided by the word of God, become bewildered in their attempts to investigate the relations of science and revelation. The Creator and His works are beyond their comprehension, and because these cannot be explained by natural laws, Bible history is pronounced unreliable. Those who question the reliability of the Scripture records have let go their anchor and are left to beat about upon the rocks of infidelity. When they find themselves incapable of measuring the Creator and His works by their own imperfect knowledge of science, they question the existence of God and attribute infinite power to nature. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 8, pages 257 and 258. Tuesday, October 20. The Biblical Worldview. God Himself looks upon the bow in the clouds and remembers His everlasting covenant between Himself and man. The bow represents Christ's love, which encircles the earth and reaches unto the highest heavens, connecting men with God and linking earth with heaven. As He looks upon it, He remembers the children of earth to whom it was given. Their afflictions, perils, and trials are not hidden from Him. We may rejoice in hope, for the bow of God's covenant is over us. He never will forget the children of His care. Our High Calling, page 314 As the Savior's eye penetrates the future, He beholds the broader fields in which, after His death, the disciples are to be witnesses for Him. His prophetic glance takes in the experience of His servants through all the ages till He shall come the second time. He shows His followers the conflicts they must meet. He reveals the character and plan of the battle. He lays open before them the perils they must encounter, the self-denial that will be required. He desires them to count the cost, that they may not be taken unawares by the enemy. Their warfare is not to be waged against flesh and blood, but against the principalities, against the powers, against the world rulers of this darkness, against the spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, Revised Version. They are to contend with supernatural forces, but they are assured of supernatural help. All the intelligences of heaven are in this army, and more than angels are in the ranks. The Holy Spirit, the representative of the captain of the Lord's host, comes down to direct the battle. The power of omnipotence is enlisted in behalf of those who trust in God. The Desire of Ages, page 352. Through his power and lying wonders, Satan is tearing away the foundation of the Christian's hope and putting out the sun that is to light the narrow way to heaven. He is making the world believe that the Bible is uninspired, no better than a storybook, while he holds out something to take its place, namely spiritual manifestations. The book that is to judge him and his followers he puts back into the shade, just where he wants it. The Savior of the world he makes to be no more than a common man. And as the Roman guard that watched the tomb of Jesus spread the lying report that the chief priests and elders put into their mouths, so will the poor deluded followers of these pretended spiritual manifestations repeat and try to make it appear that there is nothing miraculous about our Savior's birth, death, and resurrection. Thus the world is taken in the snare and lulled to a feeling of security not to find out their awful deception until the seven last plagues shall be poured out. Satan laughs as he sees his plan succeed so well and the whole world taken in the snare. Early Writings, pages 265 and 266. Wednesday, October 21. Worship the Redeemer. One has come from the heavenly courts to represent God in human form. The Son of God was made man and dwelt among us. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. That was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world, 
and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. Testimonies to Ministers and Gospel Workers, page 365. The majesty of heaven was not discerned in the disguise of humanity. He was the divine teacher sent from God, the glorious treasure given to humanity. He was fairer than the sons of men, but his matchless glory was hidden under a cover of poverty and suffering. He veiled his glory in order that divinity might touch humanity, and the treasure of immense value was not discerned by the human race. The Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. John chapter 1 verse 14. The treasure indeed is hidden under the garb of humanity. Christ is the unsearchable riches, and he who finds Christ finds heaven. The human agent who looks upon Jesus, who dwells by faith on his matchless charms, finds the eternal treasure. That I may know him, page 58. It should be a pleasure to worship the Lord and to take part in his work. God would not have his children, for whom so great salvation has been provided, act as if he were a hard, exacting taskmaster. He is their best friend, and when they worship him, he expects to be with them, to bless and comfort them, filling their hearts with joy and love. The Lord desires his children to take comfort in his service and to find more pleasure than hardship in his work. He desires that those who come to worship him shall carry away with them precious thoughts of his care and love, that they may be cheered in all the employments of daily life, that they may have grace to deal honestly and faithfully in all things. We must gather about the cross. Christ and him crucified should be the theme of contemplation, of conversation, and of our most joyful emotion. We should keep in our thoughts every blessing we receive from God, and when we realize His great love, we should be willing to trust everything to the hand that was nailed to the cross for us. The soul may ascend nearer heaven on the wings of praise. God is worshipped with song and music in the courts above, and as we express our gratitude, we are approximating to the worship of the heavenly hosts. Whoso offereth praise glorifieth God. Psalm 50, verse 23. Let us with reverent joy come before our Creator with thanksgiving and the voice of melody. Isaiah chapter 51, verse 3. Steps to Christ, pages 103 and 104. Thursday, October 22. The Law of God. God has given men no liberty to depart from his requirements. The Lord had declared to Israel, Ye shall not do every man whatsoever is right in his own eyes, but ye shall observe and hear all these words which I command thee. Deuteronomy chapter 12, verses 8 and 28. In deciding upon any course of action, we are not to ask whether we can see that harm will result from it, but whether it is in keeping with the will of God. There is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Proverbs chapter 14, verse 12. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 634. The plan of salvation combines the holy influences of past and present light. These influences are bound together by the golden chain of loving obedience. Receiving Christ by faith, and bowing in submission to God's will constitutes men and women sons and daughters of God. By the power which the Savior alone can give, they are made members of the royal family, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ. To love God with all the heart, to be a partaker with Christ in His humiliation and suffering, means more than many understand. The atonement of Christ is the great central truth around which cluster all the truths that pertain to the great work of redemption. The mind of man is to blend with the mind of Christ. This union sanctifies the understanding, giving the thoughts clearness and force. Lift Him Up, page 229. He who created man has provided for his development in body and mind and soul. Hence, 
Real success in education depends upon the fidelity with which men carry out the Creator's plan. The true object of education is to restore the image of God in the soul. In the beginning, God created man in His own likeness. He endowed him with noble qualities. His mind was well balanced and all the powers of his being were harmonious. But the fall and its effects have perverted these gifts. Sin has marred and well nigh obliterated the image of God in man. It was to restore this that the plan of salvation was devised and a life of probation was granted to man. To bring him back to the perfection in which he was first created is the great object of life, the object that underlies every other. It is the work of parents and teachers in the education of the youth to cooperate with the divine purpose, and in so doing, they are laborers together with God. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 9 Every faculty, every attribute with which the Creator has endowed us is to be employed for His glory and for the uplifting of our fellow men. And in this employment is found its purest, noblest, and happiest exercise. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 595. For further reading, In Heavenly Places, The Battle for a Spiritual Mind, page 160, and The Great Controversy, God's Law Immutable, pages 437 and 438.